This is the Quantum Biology Podcast, where we break down the practical health applications of this emerging science, starting with healthy light habits and going wherever the quantum superhighway takes us. In this episode, Dr. Leland Stillman, MD, and strength coach Jim Laird discuss the implications and impact of quantum biology on fitness. Dr. Stillman has a private practice and is also a member of the QVC Advisory Board. And Jim Laird is a QVC member and a highly experienced strength and conditioning coach. He trains across the spectrum from professional athletes to stay-at-home moms. In this episode, Jim explains his journey of how he discovered quantum biology and some of the impacts he has seen with it with his clients. Hello, everyone. Dr. Stillman here. And today I'm joined by Jim Laird. We're going to be talking about quantum health for the quantum athlete. This is a topic that's very near and dear to both Jim and I, because we both experienced problems with our health, saw problems with the health of clients, in his case, patients, in my case, because they didn't understand the uh, implications of really light and health, what we like to call quantum health here, at quantum health TV. And so we wanted to get together and talk about really what quantum health is for athletes and how we have both come to the experience, not just you know opinion, that using quantum principles can get athletes to the next level of health and performance. So I want to start off by thanking Jim for doing this with me and asking him to just give his story about how he came to realize how light shapes life and how it can be used to augment athletic health and performance. Thanks, Leland. It's great to be here. And you know, it's it's funny because it's been like a almost like a slow cook evolution. Um, you know, my first, I was obviously a powerlifter uh, background. I've been a strength and conditioning coach for over 20 years. And uh, performance was my number one goal. I was driving performance as hard as I could, um, trying to be the strongest person I could possibly be and using all sorts of fun and crazy ways to do that. And I did that for a long time, but I didn't really take in the recovery aspect of it. I thought, you know, my training was really smart. And I pushed and pushed and pushed. And I ended up around 2008 or nine, ended up getting ultracolitis. And that was a huge wake up call for me. And I started, you know, my dad had colitis. He ended up having a colostomy bag. So I started looking into people like Rob Wolf and I started doing some research and I, you know, started changing my nutrition. I started changing my lifestyle and started meditating and, 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 and started working on learning how to relax because I was working, you know, not only was I training hard, I was working 10 to 14, you know, 10 to 12 sessions a day, caffeine, energy drinks, stimulants, uh, just to keep driving and driving. And then basically the colitis, you know, was a huge wake up call for me. And uh, I adopted something what I called working in that I got from a guy named Paul Check, where I, you know, the harder you train, the harder you have to reset. But I got managed my colitis through dietary change, meditation, and, and nicotine. And, um, then I kind of plugged along for another, you know, number of years, uh, but I was still doing my, you know, 5 a.m. sessions till seven o'clock at night. And then I think, I can't remember exactly how many years ago, maybe six or seven years ago, I ended up getting my one and only pedicure. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of funny because my feet were gross. And, you know, somebody was like, your feet are gross. You should really get a pedicure. And it was funny. I remember after getting the pedicure about a day or two later, I started having this kind of achy pain up the inside of my leg. And I was like, well, I just squatted heavy the other day. You know, that's probably what it is. And then my foot started to swell up and, you know, people started to notice because I started wearing pants because I always wear shorts, even in, in the wintertime, excuse me. And one of my, you know, clients was a nurse and she's like, oh, that, that's not good. You need to go get that checked out. So I went to a walk-in clinic and they gave me a shot. They said I had cellulitis. Well, it continued to get even worse. And one of my clients, uh, who's like head of cancer screening here at Baptist in, in Lexington, she's like, why are you walking funny? Let me look at your leg. And she literally turned white. And because uh, I had gone to the walk-in clinic and gotten like two shots. And so I literally, with, with, she got on the phone and in an hour, I was at the infectious disease center at Baptist here in Lexington. And the guy was like, oh my gosh, he's like, brings in all the interns are looking at my leg and he's like, you know, if we can't get this under control, we're probably going to cut your leg off. But luckily they're able to get it under control. But then I got the lecture about how this is going to come back and there's nothing I can really do about it. But this time it's going to be like a full body thing. You know, I'm not going to have like, you know, I'll have like, uh, you know, 
I'll feel like I'm sick, but I won't have any respiratory symptoms. And sure enough, and they wanted to put me on an oral antibiotic and they, you know, all this, this sort of stuff and wash my body down with, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. Sure enough, six to eight months later, it came back. I ended up going back with a super high fever. Um, and, you know, every time I went back, you know, more antibiotics, multiple antibiotics. Um, and they're like, there's no real answer for this. You just got to scrub your body down and, and, and you've got to, you know, um, we really want you to be on oral antibiotic. And I'm like, with my colitis already, I'm like, no, I really don't think that's a good idea. So I, I kept denying that. And so I, I started researching, you know, when you, when you're in it, like a, you know, like with my colitis and I started reading and I started listening to different people. I'd heard a guy named Dr. Jack Cruz at one of the, I spoke at paleo FX and I listened to him and he was talking about how, like, if you're a moron, if you eat like a banana in Boston in the winter. And of course he would made everybody mad and it was this huge thing. So I started like following him and reading and listening to him. And at one point I interacted with him and he was like, you know, I'm having problems with my immune system. And he's like, well, what do you do for a living? I'm like, well, I'm a strength coach. I get up at five o'clock in the morning and I work till seven o'clock at night. He's like, when's the last time you've seen a sunrise? And I was like, I really can't remember the last time other than when I go fishing. And then I always wear wearing sunglasses. And he was like, man, he's like light runs your entire immune system. So that was a total shock to me. And you know, these infections were getting worse and worse. And so I started making massive change. I started taking my mornings off, getting outside in the morning, started taking my light seriously, got rid of my sunglasses, changed the lighting in my gym. And since I've done that, I haven't had a reoccurring infection. So it was a huge wake up call for me. And then I started realizing, you know, with the kids I'm training and with the different athletes I'm working with, I'm like, I've created an entire business that brings people indoors. And what people really need is to be outside more. Like, I can't even begin to tell you how many kids that I train that can't sleep, you know, because they're on the screens and all that kind of stuff. So this was a huge wake up call for me. And it was like, it, you know, and now I'm in, in a, I get to talk to people about going outside. You know, I, I eat outside whenever I can. You know, one of my hashtags is like, don't be a zoo animal. So I'm constantly beating my clients over the head about going outside. But, you know, I've created a business over the last 20 years that pretty, pretty much brings myself and other people inside. I've made some changes, but, you know, um, in the future, I, I want to live a more outdoor life so I can be healthier. And, and, and uh, you know, talking to you and doing the reading that I've done, it's amazing that this information isn't more mainstream. And you've seen uh, benefits to clients who started to incorporate more of this oh. Yeah, the clients that will listen to me that start even like just the kids that wear blue blockers. Yeah. Um, you know, I have one lady that was having migraines that would last a week. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, let's just start with like, and of course, she's on medications, she's got several autoimmune diseases on medications where she's not allowed to go out in the sun, they tell her. And I'm like, just start with morning, like 10 minutes, wear your blue blockers at night. And, you know, she she's religious about it now because her migraines got, went away. That's right. And whenever yep. she has one, a reoccurrence, it's not as bad. And it's when she's not, she's been embarrassed to wear her blue blockers out in public or, you know, she feels kind of self-conscious because, the, you know, like the lenses are a different color. And so she had a couple remissions and then she's like, she takes it very, very seriously. And of course, she's looking at moving, you know, to Florida in the winters here in the future. So it, the people that listen, it's hard, you know, it might take them a while to buy in, but the people that listen, it makes a massive difference in the way they feel. Um, and, you know, and, and once they're aware of how important their light environment is, um, it makes it easier for them to identify like, oh, yeah, I'm feeling crappy. And it's because, you know, I haven't been outside in three or four days. So people, once they're made aware of it, they start realizing like how important it really is to, 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 to be more of an outdoor creature. Right. And there's two sides of this coin for the benefit of the, to the quantum athlete is really, from my perspective, is that one, most athletes I speak to, the harder they train, the more their health issues, chronic health issues, either begin to appear anew, they have new problems, or their old problems become worse. It's right. just as you experienced. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've worked with high performers, athletes over the years who came to me because they said, wow, doc, you know, I'm almost at the level that I want to be at, but all of a sudden I have this boulder rolling down on top of me and I don't know where it's coming from. So what can we do to get me to the next level. And we, so we, we can address healthcare health issues by fixing their, their quantum environment. You sure. know, when we talk about quantum, we're really talking about the smallest units of energy, frequency, vibration, photons, electrical, magnetic fields, things that people can't sense 
or are vaguely aware of not the food you're putting in your body all that's related. And we can get into that later, but all these factors play a critical role. And then once you've helped somebody create a healthy light and quantum environment, then you can begin to work with them to, okay, what's the next tool we can use to get you to the next level of performance? Because as we found, most athletes have no idea what their environment is actually doing to their performance. And when they start to look into the effects of red light therapy on athletic performance, Thor photobiomodulation you know, has a page or, on their or just, website. Or just sleep in general. Or sleep in right. general, right? Yeah. But we, you know, we're studying red light therapy now to improve sleep, to improve athletic performance, to improve energy generation in the muscle itself. And that's where this can give athletes a total edge over their competition who are, pun intended, in the dark about it. And so my experience and story is similar to yours. You know, I was trained conventionally as a, as a doctor, graduated from the University of Virginia, did my residency in internal medicine, which basically means I specialize in taking care of sick adults. And I was very puzzled by the fact that every year the adults were sicker, despite the fact that we had newer and newer and more exciting therapeutics. And you would think that the life expectancy was radically going up with all the really amazing stuff we're doing in modern medicine. But the reality is that life expectancy is creeping up sometimes year over year. But really, the quality of life is, is terrible. We're really good at saving people's lives, as you experienced with your cellulitis, right? But did the medical system get you back to optimal health where you weren't dependent upon antibiotics or you weren't facing you know, a terrible amputation? No. In fact, amputations today in the, in the Western world are very common for type 2 diabetes, which as we can talk about as we go on, and metabolic dysfunction of all kinds, weight gain, all this stuff linked to problems with the quantum environment. This was in my blind spot for years. And I got into functional medicine, nutrition, biochemistry, fixing people using dietary modifications, elimination diets, um, you know, IV nutrition, all this stuff. But I had this subset of patients who didn't respond. And I started to notice that they were young tech addicted kids. And then I found Dr. Cruz's work through one of these patients and I dove in and I thought, oh my gosh, this really explains to me why all these patients I have who are eating so carefully and doing so much to try and fix their health, whether they're following Rob Wolf's, you know, paleo approach, or they're following some other functional medicine uh, doctor's diet or protocol or whatever, a lot of them don't get better. Or as you experienced, they get better for a short period of time, and then they actually get worse and problems come back. I dove in, I started to study light and health. I started to implement this in my practice and was blown away by the results. I had patients who had serious problems that were finally responding not to pills and supplements and IVs, but light. People who had struggled with, for example, skin conditions for years, getting the right light on that skin condition did way more for them than any elimination diet or any kind of you know, nutritional supplement or workout regimen or whatever. And some problems I just found didn't, you know, it's like, you cannot fix problems that are truly due to light or sound or EMF or whatever without, um, without address with, with supplements or with IVs or with massage or with chiropractics or whatever. And it explains so much of the disease that I see in modern, the modern world in my patients that doesn't respond to all those different things. And so many times they've, I mean, I have people coming to me who spent hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to get better and no one's ever bothered to talk to them about light. Sure. It's the, it is the simplest thing. Like you have a plant, like it's not going to thrive unless it's in the right environment. You know, same right. with like a polar bear or a cactus. You know, it's interesting because, you know, I used to have to be very gluten-free. I used to be, have to be super strict. Uh, I would literally get sick if I ate gluten. Yeah. And uh, since I started taking my light environment seriously, I started getting more sun, you know, on my belly, um, spending more time outside. You know, I can have the occasional, you know, I don't even have to worry about it. If it's, is it gluten-free at the restaurant anymore? I yeah. handle it just totally fine. Right. Whereas before I had to be like, well, you got to make sure this is cooked on a separate, a separate thing. But as soon as I got my serious about my light environment, all that stuff went away. Right. And it's amazing what can happen for people when they start to take this seriously. And so I want to talk to people about really the scientific grounding of this whole, um, paradigm, because it's really a paradigm shift. You're, you're moving away from worrying about the molecules to worrying about not only the molecules, but the photons, the electrical fields, magnetic fields, radio waves, microwaves, all these different energies and frequencies in the environment that we may be aware of, may not be aware of, and how they affect our cells. And this really starts for me with the, uh, then this paper is by a guy named Gerald Pollux in Edge Science, which is a popular science magazine. But he wrote a whole book called The Fourth Phase of Water that I encourage people to look up if they want more references on this. 
And what he describes is that, you know, people, including biochemists and doctors, they're not aware of the fact that water really has a fourth phase. And that fourth phase is what we call an exclusion zone where the water is not liquid, not crystal, but somewhere in between. And what they've found in their research on water is that any light emitted by the sun on the solar spectrum, near infrared light, red light, I think far infrared's included too, visible light and UV light structures water. Now that might not sound important to people, but then you have to go back through literature that Pollock has verified, has recreated some of the findings from, where it turns out that the cell doesn't run just on biochemical substrates a la ATP. Now I see supplements constantly being prescribed to people, oh, this will increase your ATP, which is what people think of as the energy currency of the cell. Well, it turns out that light structures water in cells and it creates it creates an energetic gradient that the cells can tap to create energy. This implies that just by using light, you can increase energy generation in your cells. And the literature on light therapy has verified this over and over and over again, which means that suddenly we've got to step back and say, wait a minute, what water are people drinking? And how is it being utilized in their cells? The question then becomes, well, how does the how does the cell structure this water? And this comes down to mitochondria, which you know we talk about all the time with our, our patients and clients. And people just need to know briefly that mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. They create energy. When you remove mitochondria from the cells, they don't produce energy. They become dysfunctional. And when mitochondria malfunction, you see cells either commit suicide, apoptosis, or become cancers. So, and many of our modern diseases of aging are associated with aging and dysfunction in mitochondria. So what do mitochondria fundamentally do? They, they move electrons and protons and, and carbon and, and hydrogen groups on molecules through what we call the electron chain transport in the TCA cycle. And they do so and they create light. Biochemists are focused on the, on the mean substrates. It makes this much succinate or malic acid or whatever it consumes this much glutamine, blah, blah, blah. And they're totally in the dark about how light is, is playing a role in this. And this paper shows you just how much light these mitochondria are producing. They estimate that mitochondria are optimized to operate at 50 degrees Celsius, which is more than 10 degrees hotter than body temperature, which tells you just how much light the mitochondria are producing, right? And you, Jim, when you're training somebody and they're getting overheated, what's happening, right? The mitochondria are combusting substrates and producing so much light that their body cannot get rid of that light fast enough. And they have to sweat in order to cool the body through evaporative cooling to get rid of some of that energy so they don't overheat. Or if you have somebody that can't handle the cold because they can't produce enough heat. That's right. Yeah. And so that's you where see a, lot a lot of that with uh, a lot of that with the women I work with, they just cannot handle cold whatsoever. Yeah. Um, you know, usually that's like, a, oh, okay, their, their mitochondria is not working as well as it should. That's right. And people need to realize that, you know, cold exposure is something we've experienced for all of our history, even in real, relatively warm places. And, you know, the more energy you're able to produce, the more tolerant you're going to be to cold because you can create heat in order to compensate for cold stress. And it's just another way in which the quantum, and this is, you know, people talk about cold exposure as far as cryotherapy for exercise recovery all the time. They have no idea of the real physics that, that lies underneath all of it. What, what are your thoughts on, on cryotherapy as far as like, I know there's a lot of papers out there about how it slows down adaptation, you know, kind of like uh, antioxidants would. Yeah, right. Um, that it slows adaptation, you know, especially if you're strength and power training. Like, so what are your thoughts on using something like cryo or, or ice baths um, to help, you know, regenerate, but not, you know, in, impede adaptation as far as strength and power? So it's definitely got a role. What that role is in strength and power conditioning, I'd actually be, I mean, I honestly would defer to you because I ha simply haven't used cold with, um, I haven't used cold that extensively with high performance athletes. And part of that is because I became aware of through my practice and the testing that I do, that a lot of people, when they're exposed to a stress too frequently and in too high an intensity, run out of the substrates necessary to run the pathways associated sure. with cold exposure. And so I began doing this kind of testing on my patients and getting them into balance nutritionally before exposing them to these stresses. So is there a role? I definitely think there's a role. 
I think there's a, it's a big open question that's in the, in the literature as well as to what exactly we should be using cold. Well, for. a lot of, a lot of the stuff I looked at was like, you don't want to be using cold, like right after your training, cause it's going to kind of, uh, I mean, if say, say like, for example, if you're a baseball pitcher and you just pitched and you have to pitch the next day, or if you're an athlete and you're in a little bit of pain and you have to play the next day, then you would use cold right after hmm. that to kind of allow you to, to go again. But the cold, like right after hard strength training, would would basically kind of like taking like ibuprofen or or something like that would basically shut down the body's ability to adapt to the to the stressor. That makes sense to me. You know, because it's shutting down inflammation. So maybe you do your ice bath the day after, or maybe you do it before your training session. You know, yeah. Um, instead of doing it, you know, right after and, and kind of shutting down that adaptation pathway. That's, that's kind of my take on all that. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And the other, I mean, many people who are exercising to lose weight or improve their, um, their glucose metabolism, perhaps they want to reverse, maybe they have full-blown type two diabetes and they want to get it under control, they want to improve their insulin resistance, whatever they should know that cold exposure turns on the metabolic pathways that are associated with a healthy metabolism. You can basically use cold to treat things like diabetes and obesity. And when you condition people to cold exposure, you're basically turning on their metabolism to burn the energy that they otherwise are storing as fat mass. So it's another, basically tool. you're, 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 if, if they are somebody that responds to cold, obviously there are people that obviously, respond yeah. better, better to heat. Yeah. Basically you're rebuilding their engine. They're, you're telling the engine, like you better start working. Right. That's um, right. Cause That's their, right. their engine is, their engine is not working very well. And the cold basically is a way to say you better fricking fix yourself or you're going to freeze to death essentially. Right. Right. And this is why there've been some, uh, studies focusing on longevity benefits to cold exposure. And that really gets into theories of aging which of course are very interesting for athletes because, and you know, a lot of athletes are just pedal to metal and they're not so concerned about longevity, but they really should be because the more you minimize aging, the more you are maximizing athletic performance and the more you're maximizing the length of your career. We've both seen people flame out, burn out early in their careers because they hit it too hard. Sure. And then they didn't necessarily know what to do in order to reclaim their health. And this is something that I think athletes really need to wake up to is something called the redox theory of aging. It's commonly, you know, touted in the alternative medical community in particular, that what you need in order to be healthy is antioxidants. So you got to eat lots of green vegetables and colorful fruits and vegetables and things like that, because those are full of antioxidants. Well, that's actually fallen apart in the literature when you get down to the actual studies that have been done on this. And the reason goes back to how cells regulate energy metabolism and decide whether or not they're going to commit suicide, whether they turn into a cancer or whether they remain a healthy, strong and vibrant cell. And this is the redox theory of really life and aging, which postulates basically that life is always balancing oxidative stress, which is a ba basically a fancy scientific word for rust. The more electro or more free radicals you're exposed to because of uncontrolled cellular metabolism, because of an imbalanced diet, because of stressors in your environment, the more the cellular machinery literally rusts or oxidizes, the more damage you sustain, the more resources it takes to mitigate and repair that damage. And eventually you end up with a cancer or you end up with Alzheimer's disease, or you end up with, you know, overwhelming uh, infections that can claim your life. And so the holy grail of anti-aging and longevity medicine, as well as athletic performance has turned into how do we optimize the cell's redox system, which is the system that keeps the cell rich with antioxidants without, uh, so that it doesn't oxidize and rust away. This led a lot of people to propose that we should just dump antioxidants into the system, uh, which brings me to this paper which is really the, the points out very nice review of the fact that we've spent billions of dollars on supplements in the last several decades. And we've spent huge amounts of money studying how antioxidants work to prolong life and improve health. And one of the most remarkable and counterintuitive results that have been obtained by these studies is that often giving people antioxidants doesn't improve their health over the long term or lead to a longevity benefit. And this still frustrates a lot of people to the point that they deny that this is the actual, you know, settled, I don't like to say settled science really, though I won't say it, but this is really the, the, what the science is pointing to. But when you think about how light actually runs the redox system in cells, 
it actually makes sense. The idea of, you know, of antioxidants being good, therefore you need more of them is a little bit like saying gasoline is good for your car. So you should pour more into the gas tank. Well, the gas tank can overflow and then, you know, it can, it can create a puddle on the sidewalk and somebody can drop a lit cigarette into it. And all of a sudden your car is exploded. And it's a smoking wreck. And how many patients, clients have we seen come to us on suitcases full of supplements that are full of antioxidants who are still really sick? So many people come to me in that hey, situation. Doc, just to pause you there for a second, for the people that are new here and, and don't really know much about this stuff, what, what exactly is redox? Um, right. Yeah. So redox, when we say redox, we're referring to the ability of the cell to neutralize reactive oxygen species. And as you build the redox state and really optimize the redox state of the cell, you're creating a very strong reserve of antioxidants to neutralize these free radical toxins that create what we call aging as a cumulative effect. Can you make that more into English for people? Yeah. Would I that be try. like your like, like, like the, 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 your, your ability to your body's ability to have a reserve or like a battery would that would that be that is the way to think about it yeah would that be a really fair? simple way to think about it is that the light like generated your, like your emergency fund like your emergency yeah. fund bank account right and the way i maybe the best way to explain it based on what we already talked about is that the mitochondria is creating a lot of light that light is producing a battery in the water of your cell and that battery is really being used in conjunction with things that are produced by the mitochondria as well as other biochemical pathways to neutralize everything that's damaging your cell. And when you minimize that cellular damage, in the same token, you're optimizing cellular energy generation. And when you optimize cellular energy generation, you optimize athletic performance, period, end of story. Or your, abil or your ability to handle stress. And resist disease. And repair yourself. Right. And that's why guys like you and I don't reach for supplement bottles when people come to see us. We talk to them about how to optimize their light environment because as we're going to talk about next, really optimizing your light environment is at the heart of optimizing energy generation and resiliency in your cells and therefore athletic performance. And that brings us to really talking about melatonin, which is something that we talk about a lot with our patients. And melatonin, most people think of as being the hormone of darkness, but that's really a half truth. Melatonin is the hormone of light. So melatonin is produced in the skin and the eye in response to visible and infrared light that we encounter during the day. What people need to realize is that we've changed our light environment from the sun to indoors. It's probably 100,000 lux outside right now on my front porch, but I'm in a room that's 700, 1,000 lux at most. So I'm getting sometimes a 10th and depends on the cloud cover, depends on the day, depends on the season of the year, but many people are getting one tenth or one one hundredth of the light that they would normally be getting. Well, what do we call this clinically in the winter and in, in particularly in cold places, we call it seasonal affective disorder. These people yep. get sad and sluggish and lethargic and depressed. What do they really have? They have light deficiency and they treat it with a sun lamp, right? And so what it's doing is it's producing melatonin in the skin. But what people don't realize about melatonin is it's not just about, um, like I said, it's not just about darkness, it's about infrared light, it's about uh, visible light. And the way that melatonin really opt is optimized in the human body is tied together nicely in this paper. The human body under the assumption of natural sunlight has developed optical mechanisms to gather and localize near infrared photons and also visible light in the most sensitive areas of the human body. What we've done with visible light only displays, they emit zero near infrared photons. And so people are really hamstringing their ability to produce light, to create exclusion zone water, to optimize cellular mechanics and bioenergetics. And this has led to a cascade of diseases that do not respond to simple dietary interventions. That's crazy, even in the fetus. I know, I mean, that's how what's many, amazing about this How paper. many pregnant women today actually get sun on their bodies. Like yeah, I, I would argue, I would argue like probably like less than 10%. Yeah. Right. I and mean, yeah. And, and, and to your point, as they go on to point out in this paper, pigmentation of melon rich babies, whether they're African-American or very dark skinned from some other race, doesn't 
doesn't reach its maximal point until six months of age, which would imply that the baby has less pigmentation in the womb so that it can absorb more in near infrared light and perhaps some visible light from the sun, which is amazing. People That's don't think crazy. about how their skin tone changes can have radical impacts for their, their health. And, they you know, go and, on, and that's something yeah. that's something that I'm really passionate about. And I have to be really careful with this, you know, woke kind of political correct culture we live in. And you know, I had a kid that is actually from Africa, he was born in Africa, and he was training here at the gym. And, you know, I would put him in the sauna and he would sit on in there in the infrared sauna uh, voluntarily for hours. And he would get out and be like, I feel so amazing. And, you know, I have to be really careful who I talk to about this because, you know, you can be called a racist and everything else when it's not even close to being racist. You actually care about the person. If I'm talking to like an African-American or somebody with, from, you know, it's Hispanic, that's really cool. And we're having a good conversation. I'll ask them. I'll be like, have you ever thought about why you're black? And they look at me like I've lost my mind. And I'm like, why am I white? Like, have you ever thought about that? And they, they usually go, well, that's the way God made me. And I said, no, that's the way the sun, that's the way the sun, that's how you adapted your, your you know, your entire culture, you, you adapted to be near the equator. And now you're living in Kentucky or you're living in Chicago, where even if you stood outside naked at noon, you know, you wouldn't get enough sun if you tried. And so I think that's one of the biggest travesties I see, like with COVID and with, um, you know, they're always talking about African-Americans have higher rates of breast cancer, higher rates of heart disease, higher rates of cancer. And they always link it to like economic disparity. But in reality, it's because they're like a cactus trying to live in the Arctic and nobody wants to talk about that. Um, right. They're and, optimized and, and, for a much higher density of and it's, visible yeah, and infrared it, and UV light. And it's, it's insane because I'll tell these, you know, these people that I become friends with, I'm like, you need to get out in the sun as much as you possibly can. And I'll even tell some of them, like, in the winter, you need to go in the tanning bed. And they're like, well, I don't want to get any darker. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, my gosh. So it's, it's insane that simple little information like that that could save thousands of people's lives is withheld from them. I, I don't know. You know, we could put our tinfoil hats on and say it's on purpose or not on purpose or right. But when you look into this stuff, like if you look into this literature, and I'd be interesting to get your take on this since you you went to like medical school. Right. Yeah. Because you know, a lot of people will write people off if they went to naturopathic school mm -hmm. or they went to holistic medical school. But you went to like the University of Virginia, which is very respected. And then you learned on your own, like, why isn't this information since it makes so much sense? Like when I got rid of my sunglasses and I started getting outside every morning, it took like a week for my sleep to improve. It didn't take very long at all. It was yeah. very powerful. Right. Why doesn't, why isn't this information? Is it money? Is, is that what it's about? Like, why isn't this information more mainstream? If I had to really boil it down, it's, it's the way that incentives are set up in healthcare. So I worked for a long time in conventional medicine because I wanted to fit in with having my, basically having patients who could afford to pay for my time and my services uh, because the insurance companies don't pay for you to be healthy. They're basically there to bail you out if something catastrophic happens. They have no real skin in your game. What we've done with the medical system is created these groups of experts who are focused on one organ system, and they study it in a very myopic way. And like dermatology is a great example of this. The dermatologists are obsessed with skin cancer. Well, what happens if they miss a skin cancer? They get sued and they lose a lot of money. They may even lose their medical license and their ability to make any more money at a significant rate. Furthermore, they do not make any money when you have healthy skin. So if you're not paying your doctor to keep you healthy, what are you doing? I left the conventional model behind. I left it behind because they weren't paying me to keep people healthy. And when you look at the literature on sun exposure, it makes the dermatologist look like morons. I tell people, that if the sun causes cancer, then spoons make people fat. Because really, when you look at sun exposure, it reduces all-cause mortality, which is a fancy way of saying it reduces your risk of death. We know this very clearly in the literature. And there's a ton of skin cancer that's definitely not due to the sun. It's on non-sun-exposed skin, or it's in people who've got very dark skin, 
who don't ever sunburn and don't have a significant oxidative stress, as we would say, from the sun, right? So how can the sun explain all these different skin cancers? How too can it explain the fact that skin cancer rates continue to rise despite the fact that in the last hundred years, we've gone from spending 100% of our time outside during daylight hours or illuminated by natural light through at best glass, right? Which until recently in the industrial revolution was a luxury, right? We've gone from that to 100% indoor existence illuminated by fake light at night with virtually no UV light exposure. With it's light like, technology that's only been around for like 30 or 40 years, even that, like some exactly. of the LED stuff's only been around for exactly. 10 or 15 years. And so. this statement in this paper is so powerful that I really need, we got to unpack because it's so, it's so relevant to all this. It is proposed that the near infrared portion of natural sunlight stimulates an excess of antioxidants in each of our healthy cells. And that the cumulative effect of this antioxidant reservoir is to enhance the body's ability to rapidly and locally deal with changing conditions throughout the day. That is a fancy way of saying light builds your cells resilience and ability to deal with stress and to neutralize oxidants that could make your cell fail or turn into a cancer. And all of this is mediated through melatonin, which circulates around the body to turn on repair and regeneration uh, uh, programs. But that without this light link, you're really, you're potentially completely missing, um, basically taking supplemental melatonin is not the answer because it's supposed to be produced in a local environment in response to different stimuli and then released in the absence of light. And that goes to back to, you know, what you were saying about African-American athletes and people who are not realizing that their skin tone determines how light is used in their body. And if they aren't mindful of their light environment and their light exposure, they can create, or, or they can fall victim to, maybe I'll say illnesses that will disappear once they properly illuminate their bodies, because you'll give their bodies the energies, energy that they really need to be healthy. And so this goes to, you know, something that most people are not aware of, which is that if you're not exposed to light during the day, you actually don't make melatonin at night. And this is where people need to, and this study was done in Japan and they basically just monitored a bunch of people, a bunch of elderly people's exposure to light and showed that it increases with the more, their melatonin levels increase with the light exposure that they get. And the implications of this are really, really profound because what happens when you disrupt circadian rhythms and you don't get enough visible light during the day is that you can create all these illnesses and diseases that are associated with aberrant metabolism and unhealthy mitochondria. And that's the, the final piece that I like to get into with people, which is that visible light at night disrupts normal melatonin circulation around the body because at night it's supposed to run around the body, turning on your repair and regeneration processes. And so when you combine a low light environment during the day with no infrared light, not to mention no UV light, which is very important for our immune systems, with lots of artificial light at night, you create a situation where the cell is totally deprived of the varieties of light and photonic energy that fundamentally run cellular energy generation. And that's well, the person, if it's the perfect recipe for disaster, I mean, that's right. No, no vitamin D because of no UV and then no melatonin. I mean, the two right. probably most important hormones in the body for regeneration, immune function, and all of that. And you basically, because of our modern life, you don't get either. That's right. And so, that, I mean, I couldn't think of a better way to destroy a human organism. I know, short of literally throwing that human organism into a microwave. Yeah. Or yeah. not feeding them. I mean, the fastest way to die is hypothermia, which is lack of light, which is excessive cold exposure. The you know second fastest way to kill somebody is dehydration. It happens on the scale of hours. Think about it. The water is what you need in order to make energy in your cell in order to run all your cellular processes. Next is malnutrition, but that's on the scale of weeks. And if you keep people out of light, they get really sick. And if you deprive people of sleep, they actually can, I mean, I actually haven't seen this done in humans because of modern research ethics. But if you look at lab animals, if you keep them awake for long enough, they'll die spontaneously of bacterial infections. And that should really get people's attention. If you're not paying attention to your light environment, which is what really determines whether or not you go to sleep and sleep soundly, fundamentally, it's the number one thing that determines sleep, then you are going to have poor sleep, you're going to fall apart, you're going to have premature disease, and you're not going to achieve optimal health and performance. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's a great summary. Let's talk a little bit about 
how we can optimize light environment to, uh, to help, you know, athletes repair themselves and that sort of thing. And, and, um, you know, I, I know the biggest thing for me is I tell my kids, like, you know, it's hard because you don't want to change everything at once. I, I tell my kids to get some blue blocking glasses. I mean, you can get them cheap on Amazon, even, you know, the computer glasses are better than nothing. Um, especially with this quarantine, I tell them to get outside and walk 10 minutes, a couple times a day, especially in the morning. Um, and I tell them to get off their phone at night. If they want to be a great athlete, they can, they, they can get off the Snapchat and whatever else they're doing. Um, and, and the ones that follow my instruction, they notice a huge difference very, very quickly. Um, and then also like getting their body out, you know, it's really, you gotta be careful when you talk to these kids. Cause then they, they go home to their parents and, you know, my, my coach told me to go outside with, you know, no shirt on and stuff. And, 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 you know, you got to educate them, but you know, these kids, they need to get light on their whole body and very rarely do they, and they need to start with morning light, but what would you recommend? And, and what do you see? You know, I've seen even in the college level, they're starting to test vitamin D levels in kids. You know, they're starting to look at this stuff. A few years ago, all these, you know, sports teams and stuff are starting to look at vitamin D. They're starting to look at all these different things that they can do to, because of course they're investing millions of dollars in these people. So what are your thoughts on that? So I think the basics, you know, you basically covered. People need to realize that a naturalistic lighting environment is the key to health and longevity. And we're going to make I think we're going to make dedicated videos where we explain the therapeutic benefits of exactly different wavelengths of light um, to unpack the importance of these for, for athletes and also unpack, you know, for example, UV light, people know it makes vitamin D in their bodies. Well, when should they test their vitamin D? How should they get their vitamin D? You know, what, what do they do if their vitamin D is low? This is all stuff that, you know, it's so important for people to understand, but that it takes a lot of time. And we're going we're to go over in more detail in later videos, but basically, you know, people got to realize there's the number one rule for sun exposure for me, for my patients is don't burn because that's how you really engender skin cancer, particularly when you're young. Right. Tanning beds, the reason that they cause increased skin cancer, in my opinion, is they don't contain the near infrared light that's necessary to produce the antioxidants to neutralize the free radicals generated by the UV light. Red light always occurs in nature with UV light in an abundance, and it's designed to be the antidote to the free radical generating damaging effects of blue, green, and UV light, which are very high energy. Darkness at night is really not just about darkness. It's about the absence of blue and green light because, and also the, the minimization of blue and green light, because even in nature, you got moonlight, you have starlight and people can sleep without, you know, you know, despite for, for example, it being a full moon. So it's not like these are going to just totally destroy your sleep. But if you're sitting up late at night, watching a really bright screen for long periods of time, it is going to impact your sleep. So I tell people, look, I want you to use your screens on the dimmest mode. I want you to use a red, a blue light filter. There's lots of apps out there. I use Iris. I have a blog post called Blue Light Blocking Solutions. It's on my website that people can go to and get my recommendations for products and how I use them. You want to use really warm light bulbs. Uh, and, you know, people who get really extreme about this, as you know, Jim and I have experimented with ourselves, will completely avoid artificial light at night, for, except for, you know, red light bulbs or red headlamps that people use for camping to preserve their night vision. And the effect on people's sleep is truly profound. And then, as you mentioned, blue light blocking glasses, these are glasses that block the frequencies of light that keep you awake. When you combine all these strategies together, people get amazing sleep. And much better quality, longer duration. They feel better rested. This is all because melatonin is running around the body, turning on their rest and regeneration programs, getting them into a deeper mode of sleep. And this then empowers them the next day to have more energy and be their best self. Awesome. That's a great summary. Well, I want to really thank you for having me on, man. And uh, I look forward to doing this again. I know we covered a lot of, a lot of ground today. Yeah. And I hope people will uh, dig into the papers that, you know, I shared. We'll ask questions about what the implications of these things are. We'll, we'll ask us questions about the, you know, exact details of their own lighting environment, because we really want to be here as a resource to help explain to people how they can create an optimal lighting environment, because that's the key really in the world of artificial light to optimal health and longevity. Yep. And in the case of the athlete to getting ahead way beyond your competition. Yep. Absolutely. You know, and it's simple, more natural light, less fake light. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It's that right. simple. Yeah. And then obviously, if you continue to have issues beyond that, you seek someone out like yourself. And sometimes you're going to need a little help, you know? Of if course, you, yeah. The hole, you dug, the hole you dug might be so deep that even if you optimize 
your light environment and optimize everything else, you still might need a little help. And that's where they come to see somebody like yourself. That's right. Yeah. And I work with people to quantify exactly what's going on with their physiology. And, you know, what I found in my practice was, you know, some people didn't respond to light after it integrated into my practice. Well, those people need to have very complex nutritional analyses done on their blood, urine. They need things like stool testing to quantify their microbiome, which also responds to light. They need all this done so that they can have the right biomolecules around to deal with the light that they're letting into their lives. And that's what I do. Yeah. You're best to get the basics down first before you go into kind of just like training. Like if I got somebody that can't do a push up or, you know, do some real basic things, I'm not going to like worry about like max squat or like, you know, any, any of these other variables that, you know, people test and train if they can't do the fundamentals, you know, same thing with this stuff. Exactly. And what I explain to people is that if they're not willing to make some changes to their light environment, there's going to be a ceiling of benefit that I can get them. And right. I'll, t- I'll tell, I mean, I'll walk away from people politely, obviously, sure. if I say to them, look, I think what you're doing with your light environment is the problem. And I'm not going to pretend that I can fix it with a supplement because in my experience right. that hasn't worked. And I think it'd be disingenuous of me to lead you on and say that more lab testing, more nutrients, more whatever is going to make the difference. You've got to change your environment. And that's, you know, something that I, I only started to do because I, be- I became convinced of based on my experience with patients the fact that light, if you don't fix it, it can derail all these systems that will not respond to any other therapeutic. Yeah. And why waste your time working with somebody who isn't going to listen to what you say? You know, that's, like, that's there's true. so many people out there that need help who are willing to try it. And sometimes you got to push somebody aside and be like, you know, if you're not going to follow at least half of what I say or try, then, you know, you might need to go find somebody else or you might need to suffer a little bit more before you uh, make some serious changes. Yeah. We both like to work with the most high achieving, high performing people who are willing to do common sense, reasonable things in order to fix their lighting environment. If you're not willing to change a light bulb in order to achieve optimal health and performance, then we wish you luck. Yeah, I agree. Well, it was great talking to you again, doc. And uh, I hope you have a, a good rest of your day. Likewise, Jim. And I'm looking forward to recording our second episode where we're going to go through all the different therapeutic uses for different types of light. Awesome, man. Thanks. This has been the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast. To find a practitioner who practices from this point of view, visit our directory at quantumbiologycollective.org. If you are a practitioner, definitely take a look at the Applied Quantum Biology Certification, a six-week study of the science of the new human health paradigm and its practical application with your patients and clients. We also love to feature graduates of the program on this very podcast. Until next time, the QBC.